Hi everyone, my name is Bridget and I'm here from Tanglewood Nature Center and today we're going to talk about animal senses. I have three fantastic animal friends and we're going to talk about their vision, their hearing, their tactile sense, and even some senses that these animals have that we don't have as humans. We're going to start with my friend Fluffy. Now Fluffy is a snake from the reptile group. She's cold-blooded, she's covered in scales, and she is an egg layer. But there's a lot more to her than that, and we're going to dive into talking about some of her amazing, incredible senses. So you may notice Fluffy is sticking her tongue out a lot, and that is a forked tongue. Our tongue is just one flat shape. It's kind of round at the end, but it's pretty flat like a popsicle stick, and different parts of our tongue can detect different tastes. Humans can taste sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. But snakes don't need to taste all of those flavors. Instead, they're doing something really different with their tongues. They're tasting the air. So when Fluffy sticks her tongue out, you'll notice it's forked. There are two little tips on that delicious tiny tongue. And each of those tips swirls. So when she sticks her tongue out, she is swirling the tips of her tongue around to make a tiny little tornado. She's stirring up the air. And on the edge of those little tips, she's collecting smells, tasting the air, and dragging the smells back inside her mouth. Once they're in her mouth, she touches them to the top of her mouth. Now, if you can use your flat tongue to touch the top of your mouth at the front, you'll feel the top is really hard. That's called a hard palate. And if you move your tongue further back, you'll be able to feel a soft, squishy part at the top of our mouth, and that's a soft palate. If you were a snake like Fluffy, at the back of your soft palate, there would be a tiny little dent in the top of your mouth called a Jacobson's organ. And she takes the smells that she gathers on her tongue, puts them all the way back in her soft palate, and touches them to her Jacobson's organ. She is able to use that organ to taste the air so she can figure out who is around her. Maybe it's dinner. She's a carnivore, so she eats meat. She would eat little rodents like chipmunks and mice. Maybe it's another snake, and she might be able to tell whether it's the same kind as her, whether it's another ball python that maybe she would want to mate with or maybe want to move away from so they don't have to split their territory. Or maybe it's even a predator, something that she would want to hide from. As a snake, she doesn't have legs, so she can't move too fast. So if she is able to detect a predator, she can hide by freezing, curling up in a ball, and putting her head in the middle and waiting for the scary thing to go away. And that's why they're called ball pythons, because in a pickle, they hide up in a ball. So that tongue is a pretty cool technique that she has to keep herself safe and find food, but it's not the only super sensory power that she has. She also has heat sensing pits along her face. Now, if I can turn her around just a smidgen, we'll get a good look. You'll notice she has beautiful eyes. She has two tiny nostrils on the top, at the edges of her little tan stripes. And if you look at the side of her mouth, you'll see little holes all along the edge of her lip. Those are heat sensing pits she's able to use those holes in the side of her face to see temperature, to see heat. Now humans can see a lot of colors. When we look at a rainbow, we can see red, orange, yellow, blue, green, purple. She can see a color of the rainbow that we can't see. Before red, there's infrared. And that's a color that comes off of heat waves. Humans can't see infrared but snakes can. She can see them with those little heat sensing pits. So her eyes are pretty nifty, but she also has those heat sensing pits serving as bonus eyes, extra eyes to see a color that humans can't see. And that helps her detect whether she's in a warm place, a cold place, 
if there's hot, big predators coming, like a big blob of 98.6 degree human coming to pick her up, or if there's a little hot spot, maybe a 100 degree mouse, she can see it coming with her heat pits and get ready to strike. It also helps her do something called thermoregulating. Because snakes, like all reptiles, are cold-blooded, they cannot make their own body heat. I'm warm all the time as a human. I'm always 98.6. But if we put Fluffy out on a sunny 70 degree day, she's gonna be 70 degrees. And on a cold winter day, if we put her out in the snow, she would be 32 degrees. She'd be freezing too. But she doesn't want to be freezing, so she's going to move towards the warmer spot, the place that's more comfortable for her. And those heat sensing pits will let her know if there's a shady cool spot ahead or if there's a nice warm rock to bask on and gather all of the sun's heat energy. All right, so there's a lot going on on those little faces, right? We've got eyes, we've got nostrils, we've got heat sensing pits, and we've got a forked tongue to taste the air with. I think it's time to meet someone who tastes with something a little different, their hairs. So I've promised you someone who could taste with something besides their tongue. And I have here Rosie, our Chilean rose-haired tarantula. And you would not believe what my friend Rosie tastes with. She tastes with her hairs. So I'm going to encourage Rosie to get on out. And we'll see if we can get a good close look at her. All right. So one of the first things we notice about our Chilean rose-haired tarantula is these bristles that cover her body. She has them on her cephalothorax, which is the head and abdomen, or head and first chunk here, and then all over her abdomen. She also has them on her, on her legs. Now, spiders, like this tarantula, have very cool legs. You'll notice they have many jointed legs. They have eight legs, two little pedipalps up front, which really help her grab and eat her snacks, she also has eight eyeballs, but those eyes are not as good for seeing as our human eyes. Instead, she has beautiful sensory perception through those hairs. She can feel vibrations the way that a cat feels vibrations through their whiskers. She even has hairs on her pedipalps, those front grabby parts, that can detect temperature, so she knows whether she's walking into a warm spot or a cold spot. She even, on her pedipalps, has specially adapted hairs that help her taste. She can tell whether something is delicious through her hairs. Now, they're not quite the same style hairs that we have as mammals. They aren't coming out of follicles, like those little dots on your arms. They are part of her exoskeleton, and a skeleton that's on the outside to protect her like a coat of armor. And when she grows, she's going to molt or shed that exoskeleton, and it, all of the hairs come off as part of the exoskeleton. So she is able to regrow those hairs as part of an external protection, not quite the way that we mammals shed our hair when we comb it out. She also has specially adapted bristles called urticating bristles. On her abdomen, they are barbed at the end, so they have little spikes, and she's able to use them for protection. So if she was really spooked, she could take her back legs and scrape them against her abdomen and fling these little hairs up at someone who gave her a spook. And because they have barbs or little spines on the end, they would sting. That would not feel great if you were a bird hunting her, hoping she would be a delicious snack. Once those barbs landed in your eyes, you might reconsider. But some arachnids are able to see with more than just their eyes. Some arachnids, like our scorpions, 
can actually see and detect the presence of ultraviolet light through their exoskeletons. They have photoreceptors across their body, the cephalothorax and the abdomen, that let them tell if there's UV light overhead. UV light comes from the moon sometimes. So at night, if you're a nocturnal animal, like a scorpion or this tarantula, if a cloud passes over you, you can notice when there's no more UV light and it might be safe to scurry about. Or on a very bright, starry, moonlit night, you would be able to feel and see the light hitting all the different parts of your body. And then you would know you were exposed to predators that might want to gobble you up. So being able to detect light via their exoskeleton, their outside covering, keeps them safe from predators. To talk about hearing and vision, I have a master of both, Sophie, our great horned owl. Now, Sophie lives with us because when she was a young bird, she was injured in the wild, and so she can no longer return to the wild. She wouldn't be able to hunt successfully on her own. But she does have several tools that she was born with that are still in fine shape, and she'll let you know just how good of a predator she is. One of the first things people notice when they look at Sophie are those astonishing yellow eyes. They are huge and striking. Her eyes are almost the same size as my eyes, but proportionally, they take up a lot more real estate. A human's eyes are maybe 1% of our body weight, but for an owl, it's closer to 10%. That's a lot of space spent on two eyeballs. Or I should say, eye tubes. Her eyes are not round the way that human eyes are. They are elongated tubes. They look almost like cardboard paper, uh, paper rolls. They're quite long. That gives her a lot more room to grow her rod and her cone cells and she has far more rods than a human being does. Rods are good for detecting motion and for getting fine details about the world around you, even in very dim light. Humans have far more cone cells than owls, though. Cone cells help you detect color, so a human eye can see more different colors than an owl, but an owl eye can see more detail and in way darker conditions than a human being can. And those eye tubes are so large and take up so much room in her noggin that she needs extra bones just to hold them in. Those bones are called sclerotic rings and they function as support to keep her eyes in her skull, even given how large they are. She has a couple of cool things going on with those eyeballs that you might be able to see as she blinks. Sophie has an extra set of eyelids. Like humans, she has ones that go up and down so she can blink and close her eyes the same way you and I can. But she also has a see-through eyelid that goes sideways. It swings in sideways, almost like a car's windshield wipers might. And that little extra eyelid is called a nictitating membrane. And it's see-through so that she can shut that extra eyelid and still be able to perceive the world around her. So if she's flying through a dense thicket or there's a big dust storm, she can keep her top and bottom eyelids open but close her sideways nictitating membrane and protect her eyes from dirt and debris but still be able to see a little bit around her. And underneath those eyelids, she has a special membrane that reflects light. Kind of like a cat. If you've ever seen a cat move in darkness, they have a layer called a tapetum, which reflects light and gives them more light within their eyes so that they have more ability to see in darkness. Now, an owl cannot see in absolute darkness. If you did a scientific study, and some people have, where they removed every source of light in a room, the owls could not see. They need some amount of light from the moon or the stars to hunt. 
But some nights it does get very dark. And in that case, when their fantastic vision is just not gonna cut it as they hunt for their next meal, they can use their ears, which are equally incredible. Her ears are tucked way down in there. When you look at her, you might think at first that these beautiful feathers standing up top, maybe those are her ears, but you'd be tricked. Those are just decoration. Those little feather tufts do not help her here. She does not have any external part parts of her ear at all. Humans have a beautiful ear disc. Dogs have nice floppy or prick ear discs. Cats have very strong ear discs that all channel sound in. Owls just have holes. <laughs> so they rely on these little bristle feathers around what looks like their eyes to carry sound in towards their little ear holes covered by feathers. You can't see them, they're pretty far down in there. But I can tell you that they're asymmetrical. If you look at your family or your friends, you'll notice that our ears are balanced. They're in a row across our face. Owl ears are asymmetrical. One is way down low below an eyeball and the other is way up high above an eyeball on the other side. That asymmetry helps them get more information about every sound they hear. They can tell whether it came from above them or below them, from whether it was in front or behind, and the very small three hundredth of a second difference between when they hear that sound wave in their left ear and their right ear can tell them about where the sound is coming from and how fast it's moving as well. These owls can be hunting in winter and hear a mouse moving under the snow. You can't see a mouse under the snow at midnight in winter, but they can hear them moving and intuit where that mouse will move next to catch their delicious dinner. Thanks for joining us, Garden of Fire kids and families. We wish we could see you in person. Come visit the Nature Center because it is open and it's always free and we would love to see you and your families. And Sophie will too. Have a great summer.